I'm literally here at the Hyderabad Formula E track beside the Hussein Sagar Lake, the scenic route. And yes, this is the last position here on the dummy grid. The drivers are going to be taking this turn and hopefully aiming for a podium finish shortly after. But that's what we're going to focus on on Tech Today. We're also going to be with the drivers, asking them what they really think of this track because this is the first time Formula E is coming to India. All that and a lot more on this episode of Tech Today. There's all sorts of cool things happening on this racetrack. Terms I'm learning today, attack mode being one when the drivers really get that boost and can actually, well, use that extra energy in their battery packs. The Formula E is exciting, just like all other EVs on the electric experience. And then, once in a while, they do need to stop. You do need to take a commercial break on the show as well. And for that, you have to head to the pit stop. That's where I'm headed right now. So as you can see, this is the pit stop. The tyres go right here. They're hand-cooked tyres, which are standard across all Formula E cars. They're in the process of getting the car ready for shakedown. Formula E certainly is the future. When you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about performance, that sort of thrill that we get on the show often in an electric vehicle, that's come to the racetrack. I'll take you a little bit on this side as well, obviously not heading to the back of the car. But this is the confined space that the drivers need to be in through the course of the race. And look, it's really hot, like I said, in Hyderabad. And actually, managing to last a couple of hours sitting right there with your suits on, it's not going to be an easy task. I've been speaking to some of the drivers as well. And of course, it means you need to be really sorted when it comes to your diet. You need to be really sorted when it comes to your hydration. And those seem like key elementary things that your mum was telling you about, but that's something that will certainly come in handy whilst you are racing these Formula E cars. Now, the difference across the Formula E seems to be the fact that all of these manufacturers work on their powertrain. Because you have many technologies which are standard and similar. As we're walking across, you see, well, yet another vehicle rolling out for the shakedown. And the technology on a lot of these vehicles is where the real unique selling point comes in. So across the Formula E lineup, you might have the same tyres provided to you by the FIA. You might have similar charging infrastructure from the ABB. But what really does change is your technology partnership. And that's where the India Connect is there and it's incredibly strong. Jaguar TCS being one, Mahindra Racing with a strong India Connect as well. Jaguar, obviously owned by the Tata Group, has TCS as a partner which gives them a plethora of insights when it comes to how you should brake, how you should prepare for the next round, where you're going from here straight to Saudi Arabia and from there to Mexico. Simulator experiences are all powered by their technology partners. Similarly, for Mahindra, we're speaking to them as well, they have Tech M, and there's a bunch of other India connects across the Formula E. Hence, it has come here to Hyderabad. But one thing I must tell you is there's another small connect for Mahindra Racing, which a lot of people aren't speaking about, the reserve driver happens to be a young Indian lad from Mumbai named Jehan Daruwala. So clearly the investment is there, the intention is there when it comes to motorsport and motorsport is officially back in India with the Formula E and we can only hope that India's days in motorsport continue to get better and of course our influence continues to increase. You've been in GP2 before and now with Formula E, a very different sort of a format, very different sort of an experience. But now that you're here, uh, you've trained on the simulator so often. Now you're here at the racetrack and we're, we're walking the track. How different is it from the simulator experience? Because this is the first time that you are seeing the Hyderabad racetrack. Yeah, it's the first time so far. I mean, I've only seen a few corners, but so far it, it's been as it was in the simulator. Now it's, the correlation is pretty good, um, even though the, you know, the track you know, the guys that create the track models for the simmer have never been here. Yeah. But it's um, it's pretty impressive to see how close it gets and it helps our preparation a lot, um, especially on the new tracks.
James, you mentioned something really interesting. You said, you know, driving a Formula E car is very similar to dealing with something like a smartphone. We have a lot of smartphones on the show. And one thing that happens in, in these sort of torrid uh, climate sort of temperatures is that the battery doesn't always work well on smartphones. Does that change when you're talking about Formula E cars as well? If you could share that with yeah. our viewers. Well, that's exactly the point I made earlier. So I use that example, using your mobile phone in the sun whilst charging it is the kind of worst scenario, right? Um, because of that, that temperature buildup. So how we design the cars, mm -hmm. one of the most fundamental things is, we, yes, we focus on efficiency. In other words, how, how long we can make the car go as fast as we can. So every kilowatt of energy, making sure that can, we can use, utilize all of that and not lose any of that in the mm -hmm. process. That's the first thing we focus on, because informally efficiency is speed. The other thing though, which is critical, is the thermal performance. In other words, how cool we can keep the car and the battery. Because if you overheat the car and the battery, again, it just means you, you have to slow down to regain the temperature mm -hmm. or you, you stop in the worst case scenario. So the way we've designed the car, the way we operate the car, the work the engineers are doing to prepare the car for the race and the role the drivers play in helping us manage that is going to be critical. 35 degrees on Saturday, it's going to be a factor in this race that all teams and all drivers are going to have to be on top of. Well, February is a big bang month for tech. It all started off with Samsung Galaxy Unpacked, and then it culminates in the end of February at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. But in the midst of all of this, there's also other Android launches that we want to bring you on the show. Most importantly, the OnePlus event, which we've all been waiting for. Was it a hit? Was it a miss? Was it a damp squib? Or is it truly the flagship killer yet again? Tech Today's Danny De Cruz brings you all the details. Hi, so we are at the OnePlus Cloud 11 launch event where OnePlus has launched a huge range of devices. We have a new TV, we have a new flagship OnePlus 11, we have a new OnePlus 11R, a new Buds Pro 2 and even one new smart TV. But what we have right now is the OnePlus 11 flagship smartphone. So let's dive straight into it and tell you how it actually feels like. Right off the bat, it feels premium. The glass and metal rim gives it a very good heft, very substantial heft, I'd say. And yes, the alert slider is back almost after a one year break. And what's different is this camera module. Last time, if you remember, it was a very squared off camera module, but now OnePlus has gone for a round version. Uh, in my opinion, it looks a little off because of the entire design and the circular angle doesn't really complement each other. But yeah, that's my personal opinion. And there's a very shimmery finish to this camera module, which gives it a unique, but yeah, you may love it, you may hate it. That's up to you. As far as performance goes, this phone is packed up to the gills. You have a UFS 4.0 fast storage, which is a rare find in the Android ecosystem. And then the RAM goes right up to 16 GB. And uh, talking about the display now, the display in general is very bright. It's very snappy. It's a 120 Hertz panel and it's uh, around 6.7 inches. And uh, it's a LTPO3 display which can take the refresh rate from 1 Hz to 120 Hz, which will save you a lot of battery. Talking about the battery, it comes with a 100 watt fast charging brick and a 5000 mAh battery unit. Now let's move to the camera. Uh, what we have here is a triple camera setup. There's one uh, primary lens, which is 50 megapixel unit. Then there is a 48 megapixel ultra wide angle lens. And there's a 32 megapixel telephoto lens. So yeah, let's get to the most important aspect, the pricing. OnePlus has priced it at 56.99 for the lower variant with 8 GB RAM and 128 GB of storage. Then there's another variant with 16 GB RAM and 256 GB of storage. That will cost you rupees 61,999. So we have the OnePlus 11 here, and this is the OnePlus 10 Pro that was launched last year. This was last year's OnePlus flagship. Let's see the differences between both these devices. So you see that the shimmeriness is still there and most of the finish looks same, but what has changed is this camera module and uh, the front of the display is pretty much the same. You go to the bottom, 
the differences are not very evident. The speaker grill is right here, the USB type C charging port and the SIM tray. And then you have the volume rockers in the same position. So not much has changed in terms of design apart from the camera modules. Now what we have here are the first impressions. The full review will come up on Tech TV Day and stay tuned for that. Oh, we're rolling. Wait a minute. Story posted. WhatsApp sent. So much to do, but I think it's a good idea to occasionally disconnect from your smartphone or at the very least from social media. However, the majority of us still need our phones with us so we can make calls and send messages. Of course, you can leave your phone at home when you go out and in my case, hopefully my cellular smartwatch as well. But the issue arises sometimes when you end up wasting an excessive amount of time scrolling and swiping away on mindless games and apps. Studies have actually shown that if you get addicted to your smartphone, it could possibly affect your relationships, mental health and productivity. So sometimes it might be wise to take a step back and disconnect or detox from an increasingly connected world. Ironically, technology comes to the rescue here in the form of apps that can aid the process. So we've compiled a special Tech Today list of these apps which can really help you digitally detox and break this addiction for you in a matter of a few clicks. An excellent all-around digital detox app is App Detox. Literally, you can choose which apps you want to limit using this very app. Then you can make specific guidelines. You can decide, for instance, how many times you can open a given app and what time of the day you want access to it. You can view your app usage and completely block particular apps. Cleverest. The goal of Cleverest is to assist you in segmenting tasks. It is simple and straightforward as a user experience. Set a time limit and maintain your focus for that length of time. If you do, your avatar will prosper and expand. The Pomodoro technique, which suggests dividing things into manageable portions to help you stay motivated and focused, is the foundation of this very app. Forest. This app for digital detox won't disable your social media accounts, but rather creates a game-like situation to keep you focused. Open this app, plant a seed and focus on the task at hand without being distracted by your phone. The timer will then start and your seed will develop into a tree. Your tree will perish and you'll have to start over if you answer your phone before the timer expires. Procrastinators will appreciate this. Additionally, the program encourages you to spend the virtual coins you earn each time you develop a tree. And Forest will actually plant a tree as a result. You'll not only maintain your concentration better, but you'll also be planting new trees in the actual world. You can view your forest, which is exactly what it sounds like, and measure your progress over time, just like with other top digital detox apps on this list. A virtual forest will contain a representation of each tree you've grown. Continue producing and expanding your forest. One of the best apps available right now for digital detox is certainly Flipped. You can join groups with people and give each other challenges just like on other apps. With this digital detox app, you can customize how much screen time you spend each day. All social networking apps will disappear after the timer expires for the specified period of time, but calls and messages will still be functional. The Flipped app is designed to increase your productivity, for instance, when you're studying for an exam. To improve attention and relaxation, you can use the relaxing soundtracks that are already included with the app. The tunes on the app are lovely, with sounds that range from crackling fires and even mild rain. Number 5. Well, this one isn't an app, but if you use an iPhone, then this is a nifty feature. Focus mode, and I'm using it right now. By switching on this mode, you can shut down your work apps for the weekend, turn off notifications when you're working or even sleeping. 
You can decide when to get email notifications and when you want to take specific calls, etc. It's like a much more effective and specific DND mode that you can use for work or play. Couple that with screen time notifications telling you you've been spending way too much time on Instagram and it changes the user experience altogether. As we make yet another pit stop at Hyderabad's Formula E, I can't help but think technology has disrupted every sector. The corporate world, logistics, banking with blockchain, government as well, and most importantly, art. Where does art meet tech? Tech meets art. Tech today has to be there at the confluence of that with a little help from our friends who happen to be tech geeks as well. Here's a Tech Today special at the India Art Fair in New Delhi. When you think about great art, you're reminded of Van Gogh's Starry Night, Monet's Water Lilies, Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. But this is art limited to the canvas. But has art evolved and has left the confines of the canvas in the 21st century? Has tech integrated with art to make something incredible? That's exactly what we are here to find at the India Art Fair. This piece of artwork is made by Varun Desai and it's called Dimorphism. It includes four layers of technology. They have a code, they have lighter scanning, they have freehand animation and an ambient sound. Let's ask the artist himself how he's bringing together technology and art to create something incredible like this. So Varun, could you tell our audience how you, uh, you know, coded this, like how you programmed this and scanned these two people and you know, what what this whole thing together? Well, this piece brings to uh, brings together a lot of the art that I'm influenced by. So the code is inspired by a type of art called optical art or op art. And um, I have coded the grid using processing, uh, which is a platform for creative coding uh, to create, to convert code into the visual format. And uh, that's the underlying foundation to this piece. But on top of that is a really interesting technology on the iPad Pro, which is LiDAR scanning, which allows you to scan objects, it allows you to scan environments, it allows you to scan people. This series of artwork has been created by Gaurav Ogle, who's an artist who used Apple products like the iPad, his cell phone, to create a series of how he sees Mumbai. Let's ask him why he used those products and how he thinks technology and art are coming together. So tell us about your collection. You know the, the phenomenal thing about the iPad Pro is that it, it kind of very organically uh, blends with my uh, intuitive practice of just drawing, right? And, uh, you know, because it, it, it sort of, it really reacts to your pressure and, you know, you can turn it just the way you would turn a pencil or a brush. So I think to me, because I have been traditionally sort of mainly drawing and, you know, sort of painting. Um, so for me, I think it's a very uh, organic transition. Okay. Yeah, which is, which is something I find very uh, comfortable. Now we are here at Cadbury's kiosk at the India Art Fair. They have tokenized and created NFTs of over 15,000 artworks sent by Indian children. And all the proceeds of these NFTs are going to go to save the children. We just saw how technology is bringing art beyond the confines of a canvas. People are using programming languages, hardware devices, moreover, even everyday devices like shredders to express their art. This was a Tech Today exclusive report from the India Art Fair. Back to you, Ayush. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this action-packed electric episode 
of Tech Today from the Formula E in Hyderabad. There's so much more content on our socials and the Tech Today website, which you must be tuned into. Exclusive content, all sorts of interviews, and these big boy toys. I'm your host, Ayush Alabadi, saying until next week, an electric adios.